The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It's the Ron Van Dam Show. Hold on tight, things can get a bit weird, if you like that sort of thing. Welcome to the program. How are you? Oh my God, you're looking good. What'd you do? Take a shower? Did you comb your hair today? Did you brush your hair? You look really good. Welcome to the program. I'm going to start off by complimenting you in that way. Uh, You'll be more inclined to stick with me for half an hour here. I do this show. uh, All right. I know. I know. I know. Okay. I know. Uh, I do this show once a week here in the studio for video purposes so that you can see that my hands actually do move. Other than that, I do this every weekday of my life so far on television and radio and that internet podcast thing. I've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah, I know. It's not impressive necessarily. It just is. So that's it. Thanks for being here. I have no skills. I cannot macrame. I cannot uh, decapage. I don't even know what that, I don't even know what I said. (laughs) I have no idea. I can't do that stuff. But what I can do is talk. And here we go. Make yourself comfortable. Look, um, get something to eat. You're probably watching this in your home. Go get something to eat. I'll wait here while you do that. Okay, they're gone. All right, let's start without them. Anyway, uh, there's a very impressive place in Massachusetts that I uh, visited last summer, and it's the uh, the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. They call it the Mass Mocha, which sounds like a different kind of coffee drink at Starbucks. Can I help you? You have the uh, mass mocha with uh, milk, please. Okay, coming on up. What's your name? Anyway, uh, but mass mocha, it's a museum of contemporary art. But it was quite an impressive thing. I didn't know this, but it's the largest museum of its kind in the country. (sighs) Wow. It uh, it was uh, brought together in an old mill kind of thing, a gigantic mill works that was abandoned, and I guess they turned it into this museum of contemporary, I call it modern art, they call it contemporary, okay, let's not argue, it's modern, uh, and that's what they do, and it's, it was a fascinating place, it's near North Adams, or in North Adams, Massachusetts, I didn't even know there was an Adams, I, I uh, you know, it's always odd when they say, oh, this is North Adams. Oh, really? Okay. And where's South Adams? We don't have one. Where is West Adams? We don't have one. Where's East Adams? I guess over there, but we don't really have it. It's just North Adams. Sorry. Anyway, so I, and I don't know if that's true. By the way, I am not an authority on anything. Uh, well, I am, but not for your purposes. So I went there with my lovely wife, and we had a really, really nice time, and I didn't expect that I would because I hate museums. I can't stand them because I I can't stand there and read something, a plaque on the wall for half an hour, and not everything is intrinsically interesting to me. As a matter of fact, very few things are in a museum. So I walk through museums really, really fast because I, I'm not, nothing really pulls me in. Uh, Ron, that's a, a piece of art by Shmo Dan, uh, and that's a, that's a house near a creek on a hill. What do you want me to do now? So, good, he painted that. Nice, thank you. I don't know. What do you want from me? What, am I supposed to stare at it for like five minutes? What's, what's the staring time to be appreciable of that? So I don't enjoy all of that. So I'm not good in museums. But this museum was very, very interesting. Except for one thing. And this is true. Uh, On the wall in this museum, and also I saw a similar painting in uh, the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan in New York, which I also frequent because my wife wants to go, so therefore 
I love it too. <laughs> so, but on the wall, this is the way you walk in, and on the wall, uh, there's a gigantic white canvas. Gigantic white canvas, the size of a double garage door. It's huge. It's more than my arms can stretch out. It takes up the entire gigantic wall. A white canvas with nothing on it, except in the middle is this tiny red dot about this big. Gigantic white blank canvas, tiny dot of red this big in the center of it, and and it's called something, but that's all it is. And there's these museum goers standing there staring at it going, that's incredible, that's really incredible, look at that, it's, it says so much. It says nothing, it's a white dot in the middle of the canvas, what are you kidding me, is this a joke? Well, they had that thing at this uh, mass mocha coffee shop. And uh, wow, and I, and I looked at it and people were walking by and staring at it as if this was an incredible piece of art. And I felt like tapping them on the shoulder and saying, what the hell's wrong with you? It's a white canvas with a little blood stain in the middle or whatever that is. I couldn't believe it. It, it. It's almost like it's an April Fool's joke. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to put a big white canvas on the wall in the museum with a little red dot in the middle. That's all. That's all. They'll be there. And uh, let's see the reaction of the people as they walk by. It's, a, it's an April Fool's thing, probably. But no, it's actually supposedly a piece of art. Now, I don't know who painted it. You can't even say it. I mean, nobody, it's a white canvas with a, who, who put the little dot? It's the artist. I put a little dot in the middle. <laughs> See, I, I, just, I can't understand everything. I, I don't get it. But it's not the artist who was deranged here. It's the people standing in front of the painting as if it's such a serious piece of something. That's what scares me. It's the reaction of the people who see this and think it's incredible. I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's like following Trump. You know, who does this? Anyway. <laughs> Ooh, Ron's getting political. But this is an actual uh, painting on the wall and stuff. And I... I realize at that point that uh, I don't ever understand the other people that walk the planet with me. Sometimes it's a very lonely venture as you look around and you see these other people milling around who have totally different perception of something than you do. They do. You see that clock on the wall? Yes, I do. Okay. What time is it? Uh, it's 7.30. No, it says it's 8.30. I see 7.30. What are you, crazy? What color is that? That's blue, right? No, that's actually purple. No, it's blue. Well, it's a tealish purple. It's not blue. That's, I'm telling you that. It's not, gonna be, it's not blue. Yes, it is. Oh, no, it's not. You know, the Earth is, is round. We have pictures from, uh, you know, the, the satellites and, and all that and the uh, space stations. Uh, it's a beautiful round world. No, it's flat. It's flat. It's a flat world. What are you talking about? It's flat. That's not real. That globe that you see uh, through the NASA pictures, that's a conspiracy. That's, it's not. The Earth is flat, quite obviously. I mean, when, you, when you're standing there and you look like down at the end of the field and there's no hills or anything, it's not round, it's flat. My God, you're walking the same planet as me? Uh, people's perception, religion, how can people, how can one human being be on the planet with so many different people that believe different things? It's freaky. 
it's normal, it's understandable because we all come from different cultures and different backgrounds and different belief systems, but yet we, we all walk amongst each other and there are people who will stare at a white canvas with a red dot in the middle and find it to be fascinatingly incredible and call it art. It's not art. Somebody put a red dot in the middle of a white canvas. That's not art. Yes, but we opened up your mind for interpretation. Oh, no, you didn't. There's nothing to interpret. It's a white canvas with a red dot in the middle. No, actually, it means that there's an expansive thing going on, and yet we focus on a small thing in the center, and that's how we live our lives, focusing on really small things in this vast canvas of nothingness. Yet we all stare at the lone red dot. Okay, you belong on medication. Please see your doctor immediately. It's perception. Everything's perception now. Everything is. Nothing's the way it really is. It's the way that you interpret it. So be it. I also, uh, I went to a musical uh, last weekend. Uh, it was uh, Jekyll and Hyde. And it was playing at the Norwood Theater, which is, Norwood's a small town in Massachusetts. Do you know where Norwood is? It's over there. Do you know where Massachusetts is? It's over there. So I go to this theater in Norwood. It's a beautiful theater, by the way. I don't know if you've been to Norwood Theater. It's a beautiful theater. It really is. And they put on some great shows there. And this was a pretty good show. But it was a musical. <laughs> they turned the story of Jekyll and Hyde. By the way, do you know that story? It's not Heckle and Jekyll. That's something else. Oh, look, look. Look at that. Look, if he, the millennials don't know what Heckle and Jekyll is. It's okay. It, it, it was a candy, okay? It was a candy. It was like good and plenty. Anyway, uh, it was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it was about a guy with a dual split personality, bipolar, whatever you want to call it. And he falls in love with this woman and she falls in love with him and they're going to get married. But at the same time, Dr. Jekyll's doing some freaky experiments on himself. He turns into a madman when he drinks the potion. And uh, he starts killing people. What a great musical concept this is. I will kill you because I don't know you. It's, you don't sing when you're going to kill somebody. It just doesn't fit. It just didn't. It wasn't a sound of music. Uh, I, I don't know. That was also a little weird. I mean, people running through the hills with uh, great problems going on around them. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, Schindler's List is a musical. I don't think that could happen, but now I don't know. So I'm not into musicals. I like music. I don't think music's a problem. But I don't understand how something can be going on. All of a sudden, you break into song. It doesn't happen in real life, so I can't really get into that. And if you don't like the music, then basically, eh, what's going to happen now? You know, oh boy. So that was a problem for me. I'm not into musicals. Some people love to sing. Do you like to sing? Yeah, I know a lot of people are in choirs, and that's wonderful. They get off on that, and it's wonderful, and I like to listen to it. Um, I only sing, I sing in the shower sometimes, but not a lot because it's embarrassing even to me. <laughs> Showers make uh, everything good. They, uh, there's a reverberation in the shower, you know, bouncing off the tiles in the glass or whatever, or in the bathtub, whatever you do. Uh, so when you sing or talk, it sounds boisterous and very, very, it's like, putting effects on your voice. So when you sing in a shower, it's going to sound okay. Also, your mouth is full of soap, so it's not as good. But it's fine because no one's there, so you just start belting out songs like you're in a, in a Broadway musical. 
And that's wonderful. And again, I don't do it because I, I know I can't sing and I don't want to upset the tiles in the shower. I feel like the tiles will start falling off the war, wall. Uh, or all. I feel like the tiles will be falling off the wall because I'm singing. It's, oh, I can't stand it anymore. I'm getting out of here. So I, I can't. I don't do that. Sometimes I'll sing in the car, um, but then I start to move my head a little bit and people don't quite understand what I'm doing and it can look a little weird. <laughs> you ever do that? Do you ever do that? You're sitting in traffic and you look into the other person's car because there's nothing else to do. And and you're looking and they, uh, they're they bopping their heads all over the place. And it's like, oh, it's a little party. That, that person's having a party with oneself. That's nice. It's fine. You assume that when someone sings in the car or in the shower that the bass line is that they can't sing. Because if you could sing, you wouldn't bother singing in the shower or in the car. You'd do it in public. So I don't know. I don't know. I did karaoke once. I did karaoke. It was uh, it was in a bar, which it would have to be for me to do it. Uh, it was in a bar down there near 495. You familiar with 495? It's a highway. It's an interstate highway. It's, it's right over there. It's right no no not no right over there there. Uh, 495 and 138. It was a bar. I don't know. Th- I don't know if it's there anymore. If it's changed hands or what. This was like some time ago. It was like 12, 15 years ago. Maybe ten, maybe it was last week. So I'm I'm in the place, and there were my friends were there, and they were doing karaoke, and they said, "Ron, come on up, let's do karaoke." And I said, "You don't understand. I'm not into public humiliation beyond what I do professionally." So I got up there, but I must admit I had a few drinks uh, that were bubbling inside me. And uh, I did get up and, and I sang. I did uh, It's a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. But I wasn't really singing, you see. It was, it's a perfect song for people that don't like to sing karaoke because they know they can't sing. What you do is, before you get up on this karaoke stage, you grab a, uh, a table napkin because Louis Armstrong used to wipe his, his brow all the time and sweat. And he played the trumpet, but if you don't have a trumpet with you, it's okay. And I got up there and I started singing It's a Wonderful World. But you don't have to use your own voice for that because you can do an impersonation of Louis Armstrong. So I, this is what I did. I see bird and tree, right through the two. And then I just started sweating myself and, and wiping my brow. And I got a standing ovation. Next time you do karaoke, if you dare do that, do the Louis Armstrong, uh, it's it's a crowd pleaser. (laughs) And you don't really have to sing. You're just doing like a mumbling kind of deal. It's great. You can also do it uh, uh, with other people too, because other people don't speak too well either. Uh, It's, it's, uh, whatever, whatever. You know, you do Bob Dylan, you don't have to sing. Oh my God. That's the way he sang. So uh, that's really simple. And you don't, have, you don't have to do anything. You just mumble like that. It's nice. All right. Uh, is there any more time left to the show? Oh, okay. This isn't so bad. Ten more minutes. I think I can handle that. How about you? The other thing that I don't understand, the other performance that I never got, so, so far, I don't understand modern art with big white canvases with a red dot, and I don't understand that. I don't understand uh, uh, you know, karaoke and musicals. Musicals, oh, I can't stand musicals. Some of them are okay, but basically they're not. If you're going to express a story to me, don't sing it to me. Do it on the stage, play it out, or something like that. Don't turn it into a musical, because you're just like breaking character to start singing. It's kind of stupid. The third thing is uh, there's a, a show in Boston that's been there forever. And when I mean forever, it's been there like since 1023 B.C. And there's a little theater, and in the theater near the theater district in uh, Boston aptly named as the theater district because that's where the theaters really are. There's a a performance uh, group called the Blue Man Group. I'm sure you're familiar with this. I'm not being racist. They are actually blue. 
and uh, they get up on the stage and they are totally blue. They're, I don't know if it's makeup or rubber masks or what it is, whatever it is, it's ridiculous. And they are totally blue. They are blue men. And I don't know how many there are, but there's more than two. And uh, I, I went there when I moved to Boston many moons ago. Uh, someone said, oh, you got to see Blue Man Group. And I said, no, I don't got to do nothing. But I went and it was just, I sat there. Other people going, yeah, that's, yay. And I just sat there. I couldn't believe it. These uh, grown men or boys, I don't know what they were because they were blue. I couldn't tell what they were. Uh, they were, sta- they were uh, unrolling toilet paper with glee. They were just having a good time unrolling toilet paper. And I wondered, what did I pay for here to watch blue people unrolling toilet paper and considering it to be performance art? No, no, I don't think so. And then they started uh, banging on some trash cans. And uh, that was about it. That's, uh, and I, I actually left. I, I, I didn't. I felt like standing up and saying, excuse me, people, I'm a human being who has a sense of reality. What the hell are you doing? (sighs) There was a bar around the corner, and that's where they could find me when the performance was over. The people that I went with, hey, where's Ron? Oh, obviously, he's not going to sit through this crap. Now, you might have gone to see Blue Man Group a number of times. You may love them. Again, it's an example of how we're all different because I, there's no way. I I can't. I can't. I can't. And you have to be careful with what color you're going to use for this kind of performance. I guess blue is fairly safe. Aren't a lot of culturally blue people. Although you could be kind of making a satirical critique on depressed people. I'm feeling blue, like the blue man group. Oh, is that what they're supposed? They're supposed to be depressed and therefore unrolling toilet paper and hitting on trash cans. That's the message. Blue is fairly safe. I mean, no one's going to accuse you of uh, making fun of blue people. But that's about where it stops. (laughs) So, I I don't even know. I don't even know. Is there is there a purple people thing? Probably. I don't know. Maybe that's a. I don't know. I just don't know. But blue, I think, get away with it. I like the color blue, but not on people's faces. It's not you know. It's not my thing. Here's something that'll tell you how old I actually am. I also don't understand why uh, young people and now older people actually take their hair. And make it different colors as if Bozo were in town. I don't understand that exactly. It might be fun like for a day at a Halloween party or at a circus to show empathy for the clowns. But to go to work in regular life with half of your hair blue and half of it pink on the other side. I don't quite understand the statement that's being made if there is a statement. Or I just like being pink here. That's what I like. And I, you, you have to, if you're going to do that, you have to really want people to stare at you. Because that's going to be the end result. There's no question about it. It's that you cannot figure that everybody around you is just going to accept the fact that your hair is multicolored. No one's going to do that. They're going to look at you. They may not stare at you like they would at a large white canvas with a red dot in the middle, but they will stare at you and they will talk about you behind your back as you're basically out of sight enough so that we don't hurt your feelings. But we're going to think, look at that person. Crazy, huh? That's what they're calling you behind your back. But you know what? If you have pink on one side of your hair, uh, of your head, then you probably don't care what they think. Well, you better not, because you'll be surprised what they're thinking about you. 
Should you just now just forget it and, and just fall into normality? No. Then what are you saying? Nothing. I'm trying to fill 30 minutes on a program on TV. That's all I'm doing. We have to accept each other's differences. I think that's the, the bigger picture here. We're all different. We all have different opinions. My God, do we have different opinions. I'm old enough to remember things before there was social media. Uh, we didn't even know what social media was. Social media to us was opening up a TV dinner and, and watching uh, Leave it to Beaver on television. Uh, it, wasn't, it was nothing. Now social media is everybody's got an opinion and we have to hear it and it's and it's and it's extreme. It's just not not you don't you don't just say I don't like it. You like whoa, it is like what these people should die. It's just it's very extreme and it's turning America and the world into angry angry people. Like angry birds. I don't know what happened. I really don't. I think social media is screwing us up really big time. But it's making us really see the differences between ourselves. It's very rare now that you meet somebody that feels the same way you do about most things. You're going to part company uh, psychologically pretty early these days with just a few matters of subjects. And that's not good. We have a lot of things in common, though, but we don't concentrate on those things. We only concentrate on the differences, on the way we look, or our sexual preferences, or our political views. We concentrate on the differences, not the things that we have in common. Because we do have something in common. We all don't like people that smell, right? Someone doesn't uh, wash their armpits and hasn't showered in five years. We all don't like that, except for the person who hasn't showered in five years and has the stinky armpits. And don't, it's not an excuse. You can smell it yourself. It's not like, oh, I can't smell it because it's on me already. No, you can. Don't tell me you can't take a shower. Soap's everywhere. There's always soap. Don't worry about it. You can find it, so there's no excuse. We all agree on that, right? After that, I'm not sure. So that's what we do. We hook up with people that we like and that we know and feel basically the same way we do so that our world can be complete within our own little circle because we all know that out there beyond our circle of friends and our circle of acquaintances and our circle of family, we all know they're nuts. Those people are screwed up. My circle is just fine. And you know how I learned all this? Well, it's not hard to figure. It's like that big white canvas of life. How we all concentrate on that little red dot instead of that whole big white canvas. And that, my friends, is my lesson for today. There'll be a test in half an hour. No cheating. You cheat and the next test is going to be even harder. All right? Fine. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's about it. Oh, by the way, uh, I don't know when you're watching this. It could be after the holidays, before the holidays. It could be 10 years old. I have no idea. But the holidays are coming up. And uh, that's really, you know, you don't have to go to church. You just sit down, you eat dinner, and then, you know, you put on some slippers, some sweatpants, have your dinner, sit down on the couch, open up your pants, everybody goes home, we're finished. It's a great holiday. But it also means seeing people in the family you haven't seen for the entire year or even longer. It's a holiday of tolerance. And that's what it teaches us. Tolerance. Have a wonderful day. I wish you peace.